two daughters, both born naturally and without an epidural. And I'm not telling you this to make you squeamish, but to highlight that I'm not a lightweight when it comes to pain. So when I say that COVID-19 was the worst pain that I've ever experienced in my life, I'm not exaggerating. COVID-19 almost killed me several times. And before you think, surely this woman must be sickly or had pre-existing health conditions prior to spring of 2020, I will also share with you that I had none. I'm a person who's never really sick. I don't get the flu each year. I don't smoke cigarettes. I'm not a heavy drinker. I eat healthy. I exercise regularly. I have no autoimmune diseases. My genetics are strong. My great-great-grandmother lived to be 98. My great-great-grandfather, 103. My great-grandmother, 99. My grandmother would still be alive today had she not lost her battle with COVID-19. My doctors describe me as being medically boring. You should also know I'm a professor and social epidemiologist. So given that I'm a health expert, I was surprised when doctors showed a pattern of not listening to me and not believing me when I came to them for help, but that's exactly what happened. When I initially got sick back in March, 2020, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't think it was COVID-19. I didn't fit the description. I was young and fit. But knowing what we know now about COVID-19 and looking back, I had just taken a trip from Amsterdam to Paris and I was on one of the last flights allowed back into the US. There were sick people on my flight. There was a guy coughing the whole way. I only saw two people wearing masks and I was not one of them. When I landed, the TSA workers were not wearing masks. They had a pile of PPE gear piled on the desk, unopened. My plane landed on March 2nd of 2020, and roughly 10 days later, I started experiencing my first symptoms. My husband, daughters, and I were all sick at a, about the same time for about a week, but I just kept getting sicker. At one point, it felt like an elephant had sat on my chest, and I thought, oh my, am I having a heart attack? I called my doctor and he prescribed a z pack Later that night, I experienced my first bout of chills and that's when my COVID-19 roller coaster ride first began. Very quickly in those first few weeks, my list of symptoms became a mile long, but doctors didn't believe that I had COVID-19. By the third week of March, I went to the ER for the first time for severe shortness of breath. I got tested for the flu and COVID-19. I had one of the first non-FDA approved tests in Texas and my test came back negative. So that's one of the reasons doctors thought I didn't have COVID-19, but I knew something was wrong. So I was asking myself, had these doctors never heard of false negatives? Surely something was wrong with me. My actual test results had a warning label on them that said, if the test comes back negative, you need to take the entire patient history into account. In March, a few days after going to the ER the first time, I landed again in the ER for severe shortness of breath. And the doctors said to me, you don't have COVID-19 because you don't have a fever. And the CDC symptom list says you have to have a fever to have COVID-19. The nurse treating me said, I've been doing this for 30 years. She looked straight at me. She took her mask off and said, you're not going to die. You have blood clots, not COVID-19. After they did my CT scan, checking for blood clots, and it came back negative, all masks were on when they returned to the room. I never had a positive COVID-19 test, and I never had a fever but my oxygen levels would drop regularly below 80%. And sometimes at night, it would even get down as low as 67%. After being released from the ER, I followed up with my PCP provider in April. And when I told her that at night, sometimes my oxygen levels would drop down to 67%, she told me that that wasn't possible and that my oximeter must be broken. I explained to her 
that it was not. And she said to me, ma'am, you don't have COVID-19, you have anxiety. It must be broken. Because in her words, and I quote, ma'am, your COVID-19 test came back negative. By April, for about a week, it seemed like things were looking up for me. I had seen a lung specialist who had prescribed me an anti-inflammatory medication that I'm sure saved my life. So it's hard for me to be upset with him about the fact that when I came to his office with my husband, he spoke with my husband instead of me. It was like I was a nine-year-old girl who had gone to the office visit with her father instead of a 38-year-old woman with a PhD. He ignored all of my other symptoms. He tapped on my chest for two seconds and then gave me a diagnosis of a respiratory illness. He then proceeded to prescribe me medication for anxiety and left the room. He's the same doctor who later prescribed me a prescription for oxygen at home, but I was the one who told him that I needed it and I figured that out by accident because during my second visit to the ER, they put me on oxygen and I felt better. Later, news reports came out that oxygen helped patients with COVID-19. At this point, it was clear to me that it was patients and not doctors who were ahead of the curve with COVID-19. My lowest point came at the end of April. My mother and husband found me shaking with my eyes rolled back in my head and I was rushed to the emergency room. And while there, doctors kept asking me again and again, had I taken any drugs? And I kept telling them, no, I hadn't. But doctors didn't start treating me with compassion until my drug tests came back clean. And all the neurologist said to me when my MRI came back normal was that COVID-19 doesn't cause seizures and my COVID-19 test was negative. But later on, news reports did indeed show that COVID-19 can trigger seizures and it's the first known illness to break the blood-brain barrier. After that terrifying experience, I sat in a dark room with the curtains drawn, light and sound hurt, the sound of laughter from my daughters hurt. There were times when I needed a cane to walk. COVID-19 had ravaged my body and left me with chronic fatigue. I had neurological problems so severe that at one point I didn't remember my daughter's birthdays and I would forget what I was doing in the middle of whatever it is that I was doing. Now I want to remind you that even though my situation is a nightmare and COVID-19 is a novel virus, I'm not special. I am no different from the people who have been struggling for years with chronic diseases. It is estimated that 40% of Americans suffer from a chronic illness. One day they're healthy and then they're not. Some of these illnesses torment people from birth to death. Others like Lyme disease or fibromyalgia are mysterious. Like COVID-19, you're healthy and then you're not. I'm telling you this to remind you that given that 40% figure, any one of us at any time could get sick. So what I'm about to say next could apply to you. Research for mysterious chronic illnesses is underfunded, and that's terrible. But what's really worrying is the pattern of medical providers not believing their chronic disease and COVID-19 patients. It's a pattern of not believing and not giving their patients, especially female patients and patients of color, the benefit of the doubt. There is so much research on patients reporting doctors not believing them or not treating them with the same level of compassion. It's unbelievable. And as a health expert, I knew these alarming statistics going into it, but I didn't think it would happen to me. Let's be real for a moment. We all have biases, but doctors, same as with teachers, judges, police officers, they need to train themselves to drop those biases at the door when they enter their workplace. Doctors who practice medicine while still holding onto their biases or are simply burned out are violating the trust of their patients. 
And trust is a key element to the patient-physician relationship. It's time for all of the medical community, not just some, to move forward. Here's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for my new male neurologist who did give me the benefit of the doubt. It was such a relief when everyone else I had encountered had discounted my situation. I'm also thankful for my new female lung doctor. She was the first doctor who actually took the time to look through my patient history. And when I told her about what happened to me with my first lung doctor, she told me that almost 50% of her female patients have the same complaints. I'm also thankful for my new male cardiologist and gastrologist who instead of thinking that I was on drugs or had anxiety, actually advocated for me to get the tests that I needed. My new PCP doctor spent time talking with me about diabetes. She's the complete opposite of my first PCP doctor who told me just to exercise more when my blood work came back flagged with diabetes. Clearly, she didn't know that COVID-19 is linked to diabetes and that COVID-19 and rigorous exercise doesn't mix. I'm lucky in that I could keep searching for compassionate doctors, but I know that not everybody has that luxury. Look, this pandemic has pushed doctors, nurses, and other frontline healthcare workers to the brink. And I have a documented history of being an avid supporter of first responders. And I believe that many deserve our deepest, deepest thanks and respect. But a lot of people with COVID-19 were sent away from hospitals or overlooked. And some of these people died because a doctor didn't believe them. COVID-19 has shown us that we need to have a serious discussion about the way medicine is practiced, especially in the face of the unknown. Doctors on average are an overachieving bunch. Otherwise, they would have never have made it so far educationally. And the worst thing for an overachiever to admit is that they don't know. But in the case of COVID-19 or the next unknown virus, Doctors must learn to accept that it's okay to say, I don't know, that humility can save lives. From my perspective, listening and believing are the first steps in navigating the learning curve of a new illness. Making integrative medicine the norm is the next step. I am happy to report that I am a COVID-19 survivor. I don't like the label long hauler. It implies that I'm in this for the long haul and I am not. I am thankful that I can stand here today and say that I can get back to writing children's books with my daughters again, that I can read with them again, that I can dance with them again. I know there are so many women and men around the world who contracted COVID-19 and cannot say the same. Thank you. Oh, <laughs>